gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, he's hurt! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are getting ready to have a very, very fun podcast today, lighten things up a little bit. Uh, you know, not everything is about uh, uh, war and warfare and, and training and all that. Uh, and today we've got a, uh, a real, real interesting guest on. It's, uh, he's been a friend of mine for many years, and uh, it's one of those uh, major industries in, in uh the fields that I'm uh, interested in as a as a hobby, so to speak. But um, it's a family business and started as a family business. Started with two brothers, and uh, you know, you get something from a family business that you don't get from a I don't know a cold corporate uh, environment, if you will. And that's the personality of the family, the personality of the founders. And uh, you get the direction and the, uh, the values that they, that they had uh, become part of the uh, inculcated uh, uh, legacy of that company. And it's, uh, I've read a, a, a guy named Howard Bloom, who's very interesting, very, very intelligent guy. He calls it the uh, uh, founder's uh, legacy or the founder's... Uh, it's like the culture that they instill. Yeah, and, and it's funny because uh, one person can have a, a, a tremendous influence, uh, down through history even, uh, but even more so we can see it uh, in, in family businesses and all that. And uh, the founder's influence or whatever it is that, that he's uh, uh, labeled it as is, is very evident in the, in the company that we're going to talk about today. But, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ideals that we briefed on a little bit in last uh, week's podcast, which uh, we mentioned the, uh, the rules of the Order of the Black Shamrock. And how we're we're striving to instill uh, these values and that in in ourselves and in our in our family and in uh, the young people that we can influence. And so we had a lot of people uh, contact me, you know, wanting to know a little bit more about that. So today, uh, to start off, I'm going to read you the uh, what we call the the chivalric uh, ideals of the Order of the Black Shamrock because they're on the wall in in our gym, and everyone who comes through that door uh, cannot avoid uh, seeing them. And uh, we've got them all up on the wall. So I'm going to read you the ones that are on the wall in our gym uh, as we speak, so to, so to speak. So we'll start with courage. Be not afraid of adversity, hardship, or of the cruel will of others. For the night who has moral courage shall wear his armor both inside and out. 
being always on the side of truth, and his heart, will, and soul will stand impenetrable to the assault of his enemies. Defining Courage Justice Seek always the path of right. Being not encumbered by bias or personal interest, seek the truth in all things, ensuring that your decisions are just and righteous, so no matter the judgment of your actions in this world or the next, they are always held correct and good. Justice Charity Know always those who are less fortunate than you. Recognize them and give them willingly of your time, skills, and worth without condition or want of repayment. For your reward shall be found much greater in their love, their respect, and gratitude. Charity Loyalty Be always known for your unwavering commitment to the people and ideals you have chosen to live by. Let no temptation ever assail the steadfastness of your sacred, loyal word. Loyalty. Faith. A knight must have faith in his beliefs, for being the rock of his foundation, faith roots him and gives hope against the despair that human failings create. Faith. Nobility. Seek great stature by holding always to the virtues and duties of a knight, knowing that by your example, your influence will offer a compelling example to others of what can be attained in the service of rightness. Nobility. Mercy. Be mindful at all times that sometimes the greatest justice is found in mercy and forgiveness. Though wronged, the granting of mercy may be the most valuable subject of your actions in such a time. Mercy. Prowess. To seek excellence in and mastery of all skills required of a warrior, knight, in martial skills physical health, physical prowess, and academic enrichment through the gathering of knowledge so as to be able to use all skills, both physical and mental, as the strength needed to serve the defense of justice and freedom. Prowess. So the ideals that I have just uh, talked about, courage, justice, charity, Loyalty, faith, nobility, mercy, and prowess are the ideals that we try to teach to all of the students that we have in our classes and the ideals that we try to live by, the things that I try to instill in my family, in my sons and daughters, myself, Uh, Once again, you know, we're human beings. We're not perfect. Uh, There's only been one perfect human or person, I guess. And I'm not him and no one else is him. But we can strive to come as close to that as we possibly can. And we always will run into uh, roadblocks, uh, temptations, Uh, side roads, if you will, uh, and things that that stray us from that path to live up to those ideals. But the important thing is to not despair in that you cannot do those things. The important thing is to remember is that, you know, you're just normal. You're just a human being. But steer that car back onto the path. Get yourself back onto that path as quickly as you can. Uh, because that's the direction that you want to go. And that's all I can ask. That's all I can ask of, of my family. That's all I can ask of, of uh, myself is to always keep trying. And that's the important thing. 
because if you're conscious of those ideals and you strive for them and are always trying to to reach them, you will lead a very, very satisfying life. And you will be much better off than those poor, unfortunate ones that either willingly and knowingly ignore those values or are just unfortunate enough to never have been exposed to them. So, you know, those are the things that I, that I would uh, ask of you, all our listeners, to uh, be aware of and to always strive for. And moving on now to uh, something a little more light, a little less serious, but uh, again, you know, a company that has those uh, values, founders' values, if you will, uh, is the company Body Glove that was founded by two brothers uh, after the war, uh, you know, World War II. And so, anyway, we have uh, one of the sons who is one of the uh, wheels in that uh, organization and has been for many, many years, a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Randy Maestro, and uh, he's one of the Body Glove family. And uh, it's my pleasure to bring him on to today's podcast, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as much as I'm going to. So let's uh, let's welcome Randy Maestro to the Ernest Emerson podcast. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's a, a pretty cool day. We got a real special guest here, and uh, I'm here today with Danny T. Danny, good morning, Danny. Good morning, Ernie. And uh, we have a special guest whose name is Randy Maestro. Now, uh, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with that name, uh, you might be familiar with the name Body Glove. And Body Glove is one of those, what I think of as a universal uh, lifestyle brand. And uh, Randy just happens to be a, a good friend of mine that we've known for quite a while. There's a there's a backstory to that that we'll get into in a little bit. But uh, they, his family, his uncle and his dad, I believe, are the ones who founded uh, body glove. So we're going to talk about a lot of cool stuff today because, uh, you know, here we are in Southern California, but I, I'll be honest with you. One of the times, the first time that I ever found out about body glove, I'm from Northern Wisconsin. So I'm way up in the, they called us Jack Pine Savages. That's how far up in the, in the woods, uh, I lived. Uh, and I remember when I was in high school, uh, in our local theater, our little, uh, movie theater that had two, uh, one screen uh in the bathroom was a body glove sticker and i i was probably 16 17 years old and i ha i didn't even know what the hell body glove was and here it is all the way up in northern wisconsin all the way back uh in the day so there's a lot of interesting history here uh we've uh I can tell you I've used body glove stuff uh, for the last 15 or 20 years because uh, we spend a lot of time in the water out here, and they, they do all kinds of cool stuff. So I'd like to just say at this point, welcome, Randy, to the Ernest Emerson Podcast. It's great to have you. Great to be here, Ernie. Very cool. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the, the story of body glove uh, you know, it, and, and Randy's uh first-hand knowledge of what that uh, company is responsible for and what it did so and, and then we're going to go into some some little side stories that are also pretty interesting that i i don't think most of the general public is even aware of which uh, are also very very cool uh that you know this this brand this name is spread in in all directions uh, I, I guess it's the one of the ultimate lifestyle brands that's out there so it's an iconic thing and uh we have uh, one of the uh body glove family members here with us so anyway randy i just want to ask you a couple things first though uh tell me a little bit about yourself uh you know i know you grew up here in southern cal but uh give me a little brief on on what you're about and okay who, uh, who you are well, <laughs> i uh i grew up here in redondo beach california and um Actually, sixty years ago, Holy I, just, I, I just turned sixty. So it's uh, <laughs> well, you don't look uh, it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel it, but hopefully, I, I I can get past that. It's all that good salt water. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, grew up surfing. Grew up in the water. Uh, learned about the ocean from my dad, my uncle, and and uh, uh, you know, still surf today. And 
boat and you know anything on the water we used to have a saying it was uh uh back in the day uh we do it all you know uh, yeah uh my dad and my uncle um came out here from missouri in the mid 40s or early 40s uh they were born in boonville missouri and uh, uh you know got got into the water and now the second generation and the third generation and and now the fourth generation i have my grandkids are oh, wow. water bugs too so oh that's cool well it's funny because uh the your son has a boat right next to our boat matt and uh you know we're, we're surrounded by body glove uh we we have a boat we have a sailing uh, uh boat uh, uh a uh nice uh sailboat and uh Actually, you you helped us get that boat. Actually, with your your influence on us, and I got to tell you that there's some there's a term that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, and it's it's the name uh, or term waterman, and that's one of those things uh, that a lot of people like to think of themselves as watermen, but there are very few people truly truly in the world that you could say are real watermen, and and it's it's a it's a term of respect and recognition that somebody really is a true, uh, you know, person of the water, so to speak. And and Randy, you've always seemed to be that person to me. Uh, and uh, I've heard you referred to as a waterman. And that's one of those things that if you're a surfer or a skin diver or a boater or whatever, paddleboarder, all that good stuff, that's, that's one of the things that you would aspire to. And... Uh, you know, I, I I see that in you. Uh, you mentioned you still surf. Uh, one of my buddies told me that uh, you're still in search of that forty or fifty foot wave out there. <laughs> you told uh, me you're sixty years old. I'm like, holy shit, man! I don't know about a forty foot wave anymore, but <laughs> certainly the twenty five and thirty footers. I'm I'm still uh, chasing. Um, this last year, I got into uh, we we have a little contest every year in in the South Bay, and it's called the Big Wave Challenge, and and uh, my best friend beat me out because it was his turn to take off on the next set. So, <laughs> you know, I got second place in the whole thing. So. That's outstanding. I'll tell you, people uh, who are not uh, familiar with the ocean, uh, a six-foot wave, it, they basically call that an overhead wave, right? Or a, a, yeah, so pretty much. They, if, right, right now they say uh, they judge waves by the, you know, it's either head high or mm -hmm. foot overhead or... You know, depending on the, the – then when they start getting bigger, it's double overhead, and then it goes to triple and – And on and on. Yeah. People people look at waves, and they uh, – the, the Hawaiians judge waves from the back of the wave, the size of the back of the wave. Mm -hmm. And I always said I never ride the back of the wave. I always ride the front of the wave, so I, <laughs> I judge it from the front side of the wave. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, a six-foot wall of water, which is a – for any surfer, that's pretty much a doable wave. Is it's frightening now coming from the the Midwest, uh, swimming in lakes with little lapping waves and occasionally little white caps when the when the wind blows hard. Uh, those are ankle biters. The a six foot wave is a, is a to me it's a f monstrous wall of water. And when you say uh, you know a twenty five foot wave, I'm not can. Uh, those are uh, exceptional swells that y you don't have any way of understanding how gigantic a, a 10 foot wave is or a 12 foot wave is until you've actually s basically stood in front of one or, or you know been in the water in front of one it, it's a frightening thing Randy I got to tell you that the the people that do the stuff like that that, that you're talking about uh, they've got some real brass that, uh, you know, I played around at, uh, trying to surf for a while and, and uh, you know, a three or four foot wave, that, that was plenty for me. And I, and I enjoy the hell out of it. No, don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, the people who get on those bigger waves, that's that takes a special breed, well, I'm telling well, you. Today, right, the kids are, the young guys that are coming up, are, they're chasing 50, 60. Uh, there's a guy that just rode an 80 foot wave in, in um, Portugal. Oh, wow. um, you know they're they're searching for the hundred foot wave. I mean, and there has been a few a few deaths and a few guys getting really badly hurt. But you know, it's like any 
it's like anything, you know, it's that, it's that next mountain, the mountain. climb, you yeah. know, you always want to get to the peak, you know, go to Everest with no oxygen, you know, they yeah. want, they're all trying all kinds of different things. So, well, you know, a hundred foot wave, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's 10 stories. That's a building that's 10 stories high. Oh, let me tell you, when you're, when you're paddling <laughs> a, and your, your uh, 30 foot waves coming at you, you're, your heart's pounding. Yeah, no you know? kidding. Well, it's a matter of survival too. I mean, it's you can die on a on a ten foot wave. Well, you I mean, can die you know, on a two foot wave. You, 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 you got know, it. Yeah, you know there has been those those guys too. You know, but uh, uh, I think people don't understand too that when a wave for a wave to form, it has to have structure underneath it, right? Of course, yeah. You have to have the the bottom contoured correctly for. I mean, any you know a, they call it a beach break or whatever. It's. Um, uh, sand bottom it sometimes will just break all the way down the beach one Mm -hmm. big wall of water but when you have cuts in the sand or cuts in the reef they that that's where you get your shape of your wave well doesn't it also make it a little shallower in front of the wave for that wave to happen so yeah you figure for every foot of a wave you you got a foot of water underneath you so So. if i had a 10-foot wave and and i was in like say 10 feet of water and it sucks up into that curl it, it can smash you right down into the oh, to yeah. the bottom yeah it does so, it does every once in a while yeah <laughs> <laughs> so think about a 100 foot wave or a 30 or 40 foot wave coming down on top of you it i mean think about carrying a a, a sparklets water bottle you know they what do they weigh 25 30 40 pounds uh think of that magnified by you know millions of gallons and that weight is uh you know it's solid there's no question about it so anyway uh, we live out here on the West Coast, and this is a uh, one of those things that uh, I remember being a little boy, uh, probably 12, 13 years old, and seeing uh, Annette Funicello and, and Frankie Avalon and Beach Blanket Bingo and all that, and uh, watching those people surfing out uh, in Malibu and all that. And I knew at, at that point uh, that I wanted to come out and experience that California. That, that's what I thought California was all about. And fortunately, uh, as much as California has changed, uh, there still is that huge uh, ocean culture out here. And, and that's subdivided into sailors and paddle boarders and uh, surfers and, and just people that like to go out and uh, uh, boogie board or, or basically be in the ocean. And Body Glove has been an integral part of that that lifestyle culture for I, I, when did it start, Randy? How did that get going? Well, <clears throat> after my uh, my dad and my uncle got out of the service, uh, they uh, my uncle was in the Korean War. And my dad was um, at Fort Ord because he couldn't he, uh, he had a broken back and they didn't deploy him. But <clears throat> mm-hmm. they got out of the service. They were lifeguards before they went in the service, and and um, they knew a. They were the big. It was the beginning of the surf culture in mm-hmm. the early fifties. They knew everybody. Um, they uh, actually bought into a store called Dive and Surf in Redondo Beach, uh, that was started by two really good friends of theirs, uh, Bev Morgan and Hap Jacobs. Oh wow, that I've known that name. Yeah, Hap Jacobs is a famous, famous um, surfboard shaper and everything. So. After about six months, as the story goes, I heard it, I don't know, a million times <laughs> from my growing up. But uh, after about six months, they uh, were basically going out of business. And my dad and my uncle bought HAP out, and it became a three-way partnership with Bev Morgan. And, uh, and then a few years later, Bev wanted to travel the world. And um, uh, uh, he left. He sold out to my dad and my uncle. Mm-hmm. And I think it was like 1950. Six when he sold, but they bought in in 1953, and uh, that's when we, they started developing the modern day wetsuit. And, and how did that kind of come about? I mean, what was there before the? Well, there was um, the Navy actually invented the wetsuit. Okay, it was, it was a real dense, high density rubber that a wetsuit would weigh about a hundred pounds in, in those days, and they used it for only really deep sea diving and mm-hmm. diving in, in in the water. They never used it for surfing or anything like that. Um, and, and Randy, the, l- let me ask you: what What's the purpose of a wetsuit? What's its main purpose? <clears throat> well, the main purpose is to keep you warm in cold water. Okay. Okay. In Hawaii, you don't need a wetsuit. 
you, they still use them nowadays in in Hawaii because of the wind chill factor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the guys are in better shape today, and they're they're they don't have as much fat on them usually surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fat's <laughs> so the insulator. You, so yeah, <laughs> the, the fat guys always get like <laughs> like me. You always get cold. You always you stay warm in the water. <laughs> but um, uh, and it's a safety. It's a safety aspect, um, but mainly to keep warm during the winter. Mm-hmm. So what? What did your dad and your brother do? That well, when they first started, they were into really into diving and surfing was their pastime. They were lifeguards, ran the store, and surfed on the side, but mainly did diving in those days for mm-hmm. um, commercial diving and and things like that. So they and they found a rubber called Rubitex. It was in Bedford, Virginia, and um, uh, they went back there and they used they used this material called neoprene for insulating pipes and refrigeration units Mm -hmm. and they would sell to the car manufacturers also for the window seals or the door seals of the cars because it was a high density it was water it never soaked up it 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 was a closed cell material not open cell an open Mm -hmm. cell is like a sponge so it it retains the water a closed cell doesn't doesn't retain any water Mm -hmm. So they had them make these the, the rubber into sheets, and um, back in those days, they, they didn't really know how to make a custom wetsuit, so they would lay it out like on a, like a rug on the floor, and they'd have a guy lay there, <laughs> and they'd stencil <laughs> kind of like a... Like a dead body. Like a dead thing. body. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my cousin, have changed. And my oldest cousin, who's still alive today, he's in his 80s, but... Uh, he was he was the uh, he was the, the model the model for it. <laughs> I, I, this came back to my mind. I couldn't believe I remembered that. But uh, uh, and then they started gluing this. They used the neoprene glue to glue it together, uh-huh. and that's how they started the wetsuit business. And we were they were the first ones to use the Rubitex rubber. Really, the first ones in the world to to make a modern day wetsuit. Mm-hmm. And today, they still use neoprene, the same sort of neoprene, but it's different compounds and lightweight it's a lot lighter a lot more flexible today uh you got the colors you got everything back then it was only black yeah so wow that's a trip because uh you know you'd think uh that something like that would have been invented by uh scientists somewhere and all that but here's two guys that are you know we want to stay warm in the water what can we do and i'm i'm curious to uh you know in those days jetting forth back and forth across the united states to find materials and all that now i can go online and just type in uh anything i want you know a a a waterproof knife handle material made of so and so and so and so and i can order it from anywhere even if it comes from iceland or somewhere and you get it the next day yeah no kidding (laughs) uh you know they had to at some point have come to a decision that you know this is a serious thing we we want to do this on a on, on an ongoing basis this wasn't just let's make something for ourselves although it might have started at that i guess mm-hmm. but uh that's quite a that's quite a leap of faith to yeah i mean they uh, when they bought into the business dive and surf they borrowed i think eighteen hundred dollars from my grandmother their their mother mm-hmm. and uh i think the first day of sales in the store was like 25 cents they sold a <laughs> magazine <laughs> And they both look They're going to have to sell a lot of those damn <laughs> magazines. Sell a lot of magazines. He goes, hey, my grandmother, I think, coined the phrase, is this a good investment? You know? so, <laughs> it was pretty, you know, growing up, man, it was, it was, uh, it was tough. But it was, uh, it was a great, the great to grow up in the, in this, in the beach and lifestyle culture that we have. Oh, for gosh sakes, yeah. So <clears throat> let's say uh, they figured out that they want to make these uh, wetsuits. And uh, who, who came up with the name Body Glove? I mean, that's well, a perfect actually, name. Yeah, I know. Sake. Actually, the, the name came back in the early – actually, the name came in the early 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, if I can just backtrack a Go little right bit, ahead, I, wanna, I wanted to tell, tell – because my dad and my uncle were, were more into the dive culture mm-hmm. than, than most people. And when they were kids in the farm back in Missouri, they had a pond – Mm-hmm. And my dad and my uncle made a – they were really inter, interested in deep-sea diving. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so they made a, a helmet, a dive helmet, out of a five-gallon 
oh uh, vegetable can, <laughs> and they put a they put a valve on the top, and they had a hose and a bicycle pump, and they'd go out on the no lake, way. and they would have rocks in their pockets and and go to the bottom and be a, pumping away a, with a with a uh, bicycle pump, <laughs> don't, don't giving stop. them air. <laughs> yeah, luckily they didn't kill each other. No you know, kill one of them. You know? Yeah, and then. Uh, <clears throat> so they would explore the bottom of the pond. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, when they moved out to California, uh, they went down to Redondo Pier. And uh, they were just building the breakwater at that point. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, they, on the pier, there was a lady selling a, 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 a real dive helmet and a real oh, wow. hand pump. Yeah. So they bought it for 25 bucks oh, from no the lady. Kidding. And they would explore as kids. They would explore the breakwater as they were building it on a little raft they made, uh-huh. and and that's how they because their passion was diving. Yeah. Their their passion was also surfing, but diving always came yeah. first to them, and that's why they found the material really to s- go scuba diving mm-hmm. and uh, uh, do things like that. So, and then they had a <clears throat> they had a commercial dive business, and they would they would check the at this is later in the 50s mm-hmm. and uh and then the 60s and for the edison plant the aes now but the elect go out to the ocean and they would swim through the pipes to check the insides of the pipes <laughs> you gotta be kidding me yeah well no. they couldn't have been called claustrophobic or anything no uh-uh. <laughs> and the pipes go for like a mile out and they'd swim up the pipes all the way into the plant in and, absolute uh, darkness, too, yeah, it would be. Yeah, it was. It's, it's the stories they used to tell were pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> were, were those so, were those uh, pipes? Were they both uh, sucking water in and then flowing water back out? Was it for cooling? Or? Yeah, it's for cooling the the, the big turbines. Yeah. So they used ocean water to cool those. It's, yeah. They'd suck water in and, and push it out another pipe, a, a pipe that was basically in the harbor, but mm-hmm. the outer pipe was there like 200 feet deep yeah. and they would swim all the way up into it. Oh, no kidding. So yeah. they were going down. They would take the key to the, the motor of the turbines with them so, so, no, they, one so no one could turn them off. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That would have been a, <laughs> Mr. That's, Toad's wild ride. Oh, there. really. But that's how they really kind of got into the diving, the, the dive mm-hmm. side. They were really passionate about diving. Yeah. Hey, um, you mentioned breakwater. For, for people that aren't um, – Aware the breakwater is a giant pile of rocks that goes on for quite a ways to shield uh, create an artificial harbor, right? Correct. So that's yeah, what that, that was. That's what it makes. It's, yeah. it's, it, they have them all over the world. That's how they make up harbors. And yeah. Uh, uh, plus, it, it gives a good surf break on the north side of the <laughs> break wall too, which is my home break. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because. Uh, uh, you know, you go, if you go skiing, you have all these names for uh, different parts of the uh, mountain where you're going skiing, like Dave's Run or Kilimanjaro or you know Avalanche Ridge or whatever. And uh, they have they have the same types of names, which which has always fascinated me uh, for all the surf breaks up and down the, any coast uh, on any in any country. And they're pretty interesting, some of them. But uh, it's cool. It, it's I'm telling you, the surf culture. Uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know. It, it's like a, almost a vagabond type, free. Well, it, here's here's something that was told to me one time, is why do surfers always get portrayed in movies as being kind of that? Hey, dude, it's just so awesome, and they get kind of this uh, stigma of being there's you know these are just the crazy goofy guys that go out there and ride these waves but what it was described to me with was like this randy the the feeling when you are picked up on a surfboard and move down that wave is almost a religious experience and oh, for sure and you can't descri- there's really no words and, and i mean there's a there's guys that are PhDs and scientists and everybody else that once you get what they call the, what they call it, the stoke, yeah the stoke or the you know <clears throat> I've uh, I've taught a lot of people how to surf and some of the best times is watching uh, really good athletes like I I, I taught uh, Rob Blake who's the GM for the LA Kings I'll be done. Um, 
he's a good friend of mine, and and when he was playing hockey for the Kings and the Avalanche in Colorado, mm-hmm. I gave him my uh, before I we I took him down to San Onofre, and that's a perfect place to learn how to surf, and and uh, he caught his first wave, and as I was paddling out, I saw the smile on his face was <laughs> it's uncontrollable. It, it was unreal, <laughs> and right then he was hooked. He yeah. got the stoke. Yeah. So when he went back to Colorado and he was playing in Colorado all year, or for a few years, I gave him my password to the surf line on the, oh, yeah. on, the on the internet, and so he would check the waves and, and stuff <laughs> from Colorado. <laughs> yeah. I, I got you. I, I'm telling you, it, it, it's as as bad as I ever got to be. Uh, there, there's a feeling that you can't describe it. Oh, there. And, and so when they interview people, the only word you have are like. Dude, it's so fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's about it. it. <laughs> you know, when you're when you're screaming down a twenty foot wave and and your heart's pumping and you're basically holding your breath because you don't know what to do if you need, you need to breathe or not breathe or whatever <laughs> you know, and making that first bottom turn and coming up and just you know, it's yeah. it's it's an incredible feeling. Well, there's something about that that uh, when you're out there, also, it's like. I guess like mountain climbing and a lot of these really kind of extreme uh, athletic endeavors, you, there's nothing else that can be on your mind. You, you can't be thinking about uh, your bad day or your good day or your work or, uh, you know, what's your kid's grade in algebra. It, it's 100% concentration on, on the moment. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, there, and there's very few things that, that we do, most of us, in our daily lives that, that give us that that feeling and there's there's a wisdom that i think uh kind of self-generates with people i mean it, it's funny because you you talk to people and you go dang that guy nailed it he 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 described something exactly what i've been trying to figure out for for many many years and it's these people that are involved in some of these these crazy sports and, and stuff and surfers surfing is one of them yeah it, it really is and you, you get what you said earlier is <clears throat> surfers always got portrayed as the you know the kind of the the vagabond of the beach and mm-hmm. the bum or the yeah. surf bum they would call surf you. bum yeah, yeah. and uh, and back in the fifties and the six, early sixties they it really was that way I mean there was very few of them a lot of a lot of people surf but but um um they didn't really have real jobs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know there wasn't you know the scientists like you said and nowadays there is a scientist yeah. surfing and um, but back then, the guys would live on the beach, live in their van or their car. Or I don't even know if they had vans back then. <laughs> well, they had woodies. <laughs> woodies. <laughs> that's the, our, the that's the iconic surf vehicle, right? Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> or a Volkswagen. Yeah, right? a Volkswagen van. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, they would live on the beach, and then as it progressed through the '60s and '70s and you know '80s, and that's when you know the the brands of 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 uh, the surf industry started showing up like in mm-hmm. the late 70s or mid 70s to late 70s uh, the first two brands that in, and the, it, it, it's always been disputed between the Maestro family and the O'Neill family who invented the wetsuit they say mm-hmm. Jack O'Neill invented it I say my dad and my uncle invented it so. but you know we're, we were always good friendly rivalry mm-hmm. we never but the the Body Glove and and O'Neills were the first, were the the really the the beginning of the surf industry branding, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then Quicksilver came along, and then Billabong oh, yeah. and mm-hmm. other brands have made their way in. Well, oh, and by the way, you mentioned Dive and Surf. That store is still. We, yeah. we go to Dive and Surf actually yeah. uh, quite often. We to just buy remodeled stuff. it a few years ago, but <laughs> up until then, it was the original building. Yeah, uh, so Dive and Surf is again one of those iconic landmarks in the in the water industry of the ocean industry out here. Yeah, it sure is, and and um, you know the good thing about the the surf industry, uh, things really don't change all that much. You know, they're still making foam and fiberglass surfboards and they're still wearing neoprene wetsuits and you still have a pair of trunks like that's all you really need yeah. you don't need new new ski boots every year you don't need to, new bindings and new skis or whatever mm-hmm. or a new snowboard or whatever it is whatever sport you're into mm-hmm. 
you can use that for <clears throat> forever, basically, as long as you can still paddle and and get in the waves. You know. Yeah. It's, uh, well, let me ask when what happened that you know you've you've taken us to them laying on the floor, drawing uh, outlines around them, and and gluing those suits together. When did it? How did it progress, and when did it just become something that? people become became aware of and well, knew about and wanted. in the in the early 60s um they were making wetsuits throughout the 50s um mainly for the dive and skin diving and scuba diving uh, people mm-hmm. in the late 50s the surfers really never wore a wetsuit they thought it was a you know you're a pussy if you yeah, wear yeah. a wetsuit you know and you know they're <laughs> men are men <laughs> this and that so um so, but in the early '60s is when it really took off, mm-hmm. and uh, a friend of my dad and my uncle's um, was a marketing guy. He was the guy that actually started Hang Ten, one of the another oh, original there. brand. Yeah. Um, uh, his name was Duke Boyd, and um, he had an advertising agency. And uh, he said to my dad and my uncle, "What what makes your wetsuit so good?" And my uncle turned to him and said, "Well, they fit like a glove." And coined the uh-huh. phrase "body glove" came came up, and it was actually a style of a wetsuit at that time, mm-hmm. which a couple years later turned into the brand uh, in the mid '60s. And but up until that point, they were making wetsuits under the name Thermalcline, which no one knew what a Thermalcline really? was in yeah. the water. I'm sure oh, you yeah, do. Yeah. You know, you, well, explain you, it. Well, as you go down, the water might be one temperature on the top of the thing, and then you go down 10 feet, it's a different temperature. Completely That's a different. thermal climb. Yeah. So um, no one knew what that meant, so they had to come up with something better than thermal <laughs> Thermal <climb. laughs> Iconic brand. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then in the, as we moved through the 70s and uh, late 60s and 70s, it, it, it was really just a wetsuit company. And uh, it wasn't until the 80s it became a actually a national brand, and uh, we started doing apparel and footwear and and everything and licensing our name. And mm-hmm. we kind of learned the licensing game from the one of the you know the, we took a took a kind of a schooling from the people that really invented it was Disney. And, oh yeah. Uh, um, we had a one of the Disney licensees was our main licensee for apparel. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first year, I think they, in apparel, they did about fifteen million dollars in the first year. Oh wow! And this was like in the early, early eighty, like eighty, eighty one, eighty two, and um, uh, we would get a, we were getting a percentage, you know, mm-hmm. the licensing fee, and we loved it. It was yeah. like wow, we're now we're making money, you know. Yeah, finally, huh? Yeah. So, well. It, the let's step back again to the uh, cutting those neoprene suits out. Uh, I imagine that in the beginning they were using a big pair of shears or scissors and cutting them out. But what what how how do you make a wetsuit? What did they do then to start making? Well, the mo- then, more than one at a time. Well, you know when I when I first started working for the company, every you, you start sweeping floors and then you get up to cutting cutting the the patterns out Mm -hmm. so they'd make a pattern and they'd stack about 15 to 20 sheets of rubber in a stack and they had a big electric cutting knife back Mm -hmm. back when they were first started you're right they were just using a big pair of shears shears yeah and uh but as it, it progressed they had these big cutting knives electric cutting knives on the big giant tables and um i learned how to cut rubber and then I had to go over and learn how to glue it together, and then I had to sew on a sewing machine, and and uh, at the end result, it it, um, it would you know come out. Mm-hmm. And I used to I used to actually give tours of our factory to designers for uh, Otis Parsons, Parsons downtown, all the design company, all the design mm-hmm. colleges and stuff would come and take a tour with their students, show them how to because they were getting into the apparel business. Mm-hmm. They wanted to see something different than just how to how to make a T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. You know? So but. now I imagine that in the beginning it was mainly men's uh, was your target, or was the actual you know purchasing people that bought those suits. But there had to be a time when women uh, started 
Yeah, it was back in the in the fifties and sixties. It was dominantly men. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a few women that would surf and and scuba dive and things like that, but um, uh, not very many. And mm-hmm. and and it it really kind of took off more so in um, in the seventies with with the surfing side of things. Mm-hmm. As the boards got shorter, the, the the women were able to carry the boards easier and yeah, yeah. and ride them better and and things like that. So that's when it really kind of took off. Well, as the father of two daughters that surfed, uh, I'll <laughs> tell you it's uh that's a huge part of the industry now. And I mean the Oh, yeah. it's it's gigantic. And of course they had body glove uh wetsuits and all that uh all through their surfing careers. And uh when you started the first uh suits were they were they just a did they always have the zipper and everything in the back or you know now they're pretty they're it's so freaking high tech it's yeah it's pretty they're pretty high tech like a today. moon suit almost. yeah yeah uh back in the day they they had more of a uh a jacket and a farmer john style pants mm-hmm. and uh that's the, how that started and then they they uh my uncle designed the first one piece suit with a front zipper <clears throat> And then we uh, switched it out to a back zipper. We were the first ones to do a back zipper. And then we invented the no-zip wet full suit, one-piece full suit, too. So, um, which had a pat. We have a pat. We had a patent on that. Mm-hmm. It ran out years ago. But mm-hmm. uh, that was developed in the early 80s. And would you say that most of the suits that you guys were making as body glove during the 50s and 60s, at least, uh, they went, mainly went to divers? Uh, people that were involved in the scuba diving, Ma- mainly to divers. Oh. Uh, in the early '60s, it, it it became more popular in the surf culture, and by the mid '60s, everybody was wearing a wetsuit. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, the the ocean water can be really warm, and of course, depending on on where you are, uh, if you're in the Caribbean or even Hawaii and places like that, it's it's generally pretty warm. But I'll tell you what, the water here in, in Southern California, which is considered the warm part of the state. Uh, if you go out in November, December, January, that water is pretty, pretty, pretty cold. And, I mean, it'll suck the, the heat out of you in, in a matter of minutes. And uh, explain a little bit about what does a wetsuit do to keep you warm? How does that function? Well, you have a insulation. <clears throat> and really what the, the, the purpose for the wetsuit is to get a little water inside your wetsuit mm-hmm. to make a layer of a barrier of water, which your body will heat up almost immediately. Um, and then that it, the insulation keeps that keeps your body warm mm-hmm. that way, you know. In in a if you went out in, during the winter here and in you know it gets down to fifty seven, fifty six degrees. Without a wetsuit, you can't really stay in the water that long. You got to go. Oh yeah. Get out of the water. In the old days, when my dad was surfing with no wetsuit in the early fifties and late forties, they go on the winter and run up to the car and turn the heater on, you know, or get by, sit by the bonfire to get warm and go catch one more wave and then yeah. run back up and get warm. And um, actually, they even used to use, during the winter, they used to wear um, big wool navy sweaters, mm-hmm. those woolly navy sweaters. Yeah. And they would use those. And if they got wet, they'd take them off out there and wring them out, swing them around their head and <laughs> to wring them out and then put it back on because a, a wool sweater, or even wet, will keep you warm. Yeah. And uh, but uh, you know it really those days were uh, 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 that's the function of a wetsuit is to mm-hmm. you know insulate you from the cold water and um, uh, now you have all different types of thicknesses of wetsuit. I was going to say there's there's different <clears throat> grades right for yeah you have you know as you go north the water gets colder and you'll be if you want to surf up in San Francisco say during the winter uh, you'll be in a five four three wetsuit mm-hmm. five mil on the body four behind the legs and then three mil arms so you can paddle easier uh, the thicker the wetsuit the harder it is to paddle oh yeah it's like a well you know it, when uh, you think about a wetsuit uh, the, uh, the uh, elbow elbow pads and knee pads that you would buy the they're kind of made out of the same kind of neoprene right sure yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they kick, they can hold your knee joint or or whatever in place because they're that tight and uh and plus, it gives you warmth. I mean, we were oh, yeah. actually Body Glove was the first company to do neoprene orthopedic equipment. Oh too. no, kidding! I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, we did that for uh, 
uh, a couple companies and then we turned it into we did a private label for a couple companies we developed all the product mm -hmm. and then uh, <clears throat> we decided we were, wanted to make more money so we put our own name on it and started selling it to the stores mm -hmm. and then we dealt with all the major basketball players the hockey oh, yeah. players football players um we made it to the sp cover of Sports Illustrated with Magic Johnson with body glove knee braces on oh, back no in way. the day. Yeah, I'll be damned. See, I didn't even know any of that. <clears throat> there's, there's so much rich history uh, around <laughs> around body glove that uh, uh, I don't think anybody really has the the whole picture except for you guys because uh, it's it's just not common knowledge. Yeah. The <clears throat> so when did body glove actually get explode into the uh well l l let me back up just a bit because I'm, I'm so curious about this uh it was a local brand it was used by guys here in, in southern cal and all that and i'm sure they had that grew into quite a, a loyal uh, cadre of people that you know swore by body glove and used it all the time but how did it expand out of southern california and, and become known how did it get pasted on my <laughs> the theater of my <laughs> wall of my theater back in northern well, wisconsin <laughs> like i said back in the late 60s is really when the <clears throat> the surf culture started taking off and uh there were a couple brands besides body glove mm -hmm. and you had the o'neill brand you had hang 10 mm -hmm. then you had op came into the picture for the oh, yeah. apparel hang 10 and op were the first apparel companies basically um the we would sell wetsuits to Japan back in the 70s. We'd sell them to Florida. We'd sell them to up and down the, the West Coast for surf shops. Mm -hmm. Very few surf shops were in the Northeast. There were maybe yeah. one or two. Um, uh, and they would buy them and we'd ship them back there. But it, really when it took off is um, uh, in, the, in 1980 or 1981 uh, when we turned it into more than just a wetsuit brand mm -hmm. and we found a, a company to do licensing with uh, which was the Disney company uh, a, a licensee for Disney at the time mm -hmm. and um, uh, when you have a, a apparel side of things and you have wetsuits you have a full package to walk into the stores yeah and surf shops were popping up everywhere at that time oh, yeah. you know they were popping up in Texas and then up and down the east coast and up and down the west coast mm -hmm. so um, the surf culture really took off in the in the you know 78 79 and mm -hmm. into the early 80s and and that's how you know we began that's how that's when the brand really sprouted so the customers carried the name all over i mean i i know guys that were surfing if the the iconic surf movie is uh, endless summer and those guys were in search of the uh, you know eternal waves, I guess, all over the world, and I, I'm sure not they're not the only guys that were out there, uh, you know, taking that surf culture. Because again, if, for people that aren't familiar with the Endless Summer, it's it's an outstanding movie, but it shows a lot of things where <clears throat> these surfers uh, went to places where no one had ever surfed before, and all of a sudden, uh, while they're out there in the wave surfing, there's all kinds of people watching and all that. And then all of a sudden, you've got kids out there on, on ironing boards and pieces of, of plywood trying to imitate the surf, you know, these guys riding these waves. And I got to think that that kind of happened with Body Globe. The surfers themselves took the brand all over wherever they traveled to go surfing well when you when you did travel uh i mean that that was called the endless summer so wherever they went it was summertime so they really mm -hmm. didn't use wetsuits in that movie and, yeah and but uh you know the first travelers would would travel all over the world to and they'd take a wetsuit with them yeah, yeah. and that's basically you know that's part of your quiver that's part of your you yeah know, and today's you you travel with if you travel you travel with three boards and you travel with a full suit, a spring mm -hmm. suit, and a, maybe a vest or something, oh, yeah. you know. Well, I, I'm sure there were people that th these guys would show up, surfers would show up, and there'd be guys going, what the heck is that? Where, where did you get that? And uh, Oh, yeah, back then it, was, yeah. it, it was, wasn't was very... Uh, there was no internet. <laughs> there was no internet. <laughs> there wasn't a, probably even a surf magazine at that yeah, time. Yeah, there, there was. There was, was Surfer. There? Surfer came out in, uh, I think, 1960. Oh, no way. I have the one of the I have the original on my wall in my house. Oh, I'll be darned! So how uh, cool is that? Yeah, 
but um, um, yeah, they, no, they, they people looked in the magazines. They, you know, I mean, I remember being a kid waiting for the the next Surfer magazine to come yeah. in the mail. You know, and I was my dad was in the industry. You yeah, know? so it was it was uh, it was still a stoke for me. Oh yeah, well, it still is a stoke, yeah. Randy. I can just tell by by the way you talk about this stuff. The so what is Body Glove doing now? What I mean, they they we know they still have all of the wetsuit stuff and everything, and they've got the apparel. But I mean, they sell all kinds of things, right? Isn't well, like I said, back in the eighties is when the licensing game started for us. Mm-hmm. We owned the wetsuit company. We did that. We manufactured. We wholesaled. We supported the dealers that way. But we also had licensees that that would go out and do. Um, men's apparel then <clears throat> in the mid 80s um, we had a we had a, a, a wetsuit called the Frenchie it was a girl's wetsuit really high cut mm-hmm. low top you know really sexy type of uh, uh, wetsuit and we did a we did a couple cover or a couple posters with different uh, actresses mm-hmm. uh, Heather uh, Heather Locklear and oh yeah and uh, I mean we would that would definitely sell some. Yeah, some it was suits. really good. <laughs> so we were we were uh, doing apparel, men's apparel, and this lady came to our licensee and said, "Hey, I want I'm a I'm a swimwear designer, and I want to do body glove swimwear." And uh, and then she came down and met with us, and and because I was designing at the time a, a few of the wetsuits and things like that, and I helped her design. The, f- the first bikini body glove bikini in the uh, at a neoprene oh. because it's different than just lycra because it's got to be cut differently and mm-hmm. you know it's easier to make a, a well not today the bikinis are <laughs> there's not much to them anyway but, <laughs> a couple triangles <laughs> yeah but, uh, um, <clears throat> back then with and then that just took off and we were with by the end of the 80s we were we were selling more bikinis than we were wetsuits. So. Made from the neoprene? <clears throat> yeah. Lovely darn. Yeah, it would dick off huge. Actually, I was on the internet yesterday and on Facebook, and then and a, a body glove bikini came up. The neoprene bikini came up, the same one we designed back oh, in the 80s. It's being sold today through our licensee. Lovely darn. So, so <clears throat> is, is body glove sold in, like, I... I I've got to think I've seen it in department stores and stuff like oh, that yeah. all we, over the U.S. We sell everywhere. Now. Yeah. I mean, I, the thing about Body Glove, it compared to other brands in the surf industry, um, we've been able to be kind of from A to Z. Mm-hmm. Okay. We make what really good wetsuits. We make good apparel. But we also did neoprene orthopedic equipment with mm-hmm. our name on it. Yeah. Then we got into – we met these guys that – that uh, said we want to make phone covers out of neoprene. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, we're the biggest phone cover company out of the – we're the only phone cover. And they were making – that's when the flip phone was out. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. even the iPhone. I think I had one of those. Yeah. The flip phone and the, and the body glove yeah. phone. And so that was kind of really cool. We made those. Then they, you know, uh, in our factory down there in Hermosa Beach – and uh and now we're with a big company out of out of uh chicago mm-hmm. and um they do all our phone covers and they you know one time they were you would be amazed how many phone covers they sell <laughs> it's pretty pretty wild yeah well when uh, <clears throat> when you you mentioned the factory in, in hermosa at at its peak uh how many people were actually working in that well we had about 300 employees uh-huh. and we had three shifts Wow. So we were basically twenty four, yeah, twenty four uh, hours a day, and uh, um, it was it was good. It was, I mean, we were making a lot of wetsuits. Mm-hmm. We were cranking stuff out that, that, you know, and we were the last company to stay in the U.S. for manufacturing. Yeah, and then it just got too, especially here in California, it just got too hard to be a manufacturer. They the, the all the regulations and yeah, you know. We're, we're in the middle of that. Oh, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. So, do you remember when you got the first color other than black in wetsuits? And stuff? It was, uh, well, actually in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, they started putting nylon on the outside mm-hmm. of the neoprene. So they would sandwich nylon on both sides so you could slide it on your bodies there and then and then it would um, uh, you'd have you color. color it, yeah. You'd have color. But it was actually a cooler material because the nylon would the fabric would absorb a little water mm-hmm. and then when the wind hit it you get the cooling. Oh yeah. You get the it's like wearing yeah, a wet t shirt yeah. when you're in the wind. It, yeah. It's actually it's actually better if you take the t shirt off, off and you then you'll get dry even though it'll be windy, it'll mm-hmm. you'll be dry. So uh, you get it's called cooling from evaporation. Yeah, so, yeah. Technical term. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And now you can get anything, any color. I mean, from lime green to. Oh yeah, we we were the ones that brought the fluorescence to the surf industry, and Body Glove did the first fluorescent green, fluorescent orange, and yellow, and really, yeah, wow. So. And um, it's it's everything. I, I, for people that are thinking about wetsuits and all that too, there's also uh, the booties that you can wear, right? Booties, gloves, hoods, hoods, the whole yeah. nine yards. So yeah. you can you can get gloved up, so to speak, uh, head to toe. And, and oh, all for that. sure. Yeah. Well, especially the surfers that surf up where you came from, up in Wisconsin, <laughs> on the on the lakes up there. They there is waves in the uh, during the winter. Yeah. And these guys come out. They're got everything but their beards hanging out, and it's it's got icicles <laughs> hanging off it. And it's pretty trippy. You, you got to be pretty dedicated. I'll tell you what. When you fall hey, I, in the water, I went to New York back in yeah. the eighties with with our, one of our reps, and he goes, "Let's go surf." And I go, "This is New York. You're and mine. I'm not surfing. It's snowing outside." <laughs> he goes, ah. "I go. I don't care if my dad owns a wetsuit company yeah. or not. I'm not yeah, going I'm not. surfing in the snow." <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've seen pictures. Uh, I, I've heard of the guys surfing in the great lakes uh but i've seen pictures of uh, people up, up in iceland and places like that now uh surfing with you know uh glacier um icebergs in the background sure. and stuff and i'm like that's the new thing today all the kids are doing adventure i mean there yeah. there are there is a pro circuit in surfing but most of the kids that are <clears throat> that are 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 making a living at surfing mm-hmm. are the ones that are doing travel they're getting sponsored by different companies they're more adventure uh types of people you know mm-hmm. and uh they're they're going everywhere up in alaska to iceland to you know they want to surf and see the 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 uh the northern lights while they're surfing yeah you know and uh, uh it's kind of cool it's it's a neat way and and getting back to what you said when in the 50s how the people lived and they were always mm-hmm. thought of surf bums this whole new thing is becoming back to be surf bums mm-hmm. and people living in their vans and traveling and surfing. And actually in Europe, in the west coast of France, it's, it's more prevalent in, in, uh, as the surf culture is so, so much more. It's really, it's really because we have so much here. Mm-hmm. We have so many. I mean, your kid might surf, but he might be in soccer too, or he might be. This. Yeah. There's so much opportunity in in California and mm-hmm. on the East Coast, and but um, uh, in Europe, it's a it's a big surf culture. People living in their vans and surfing up and down the coast, and just kind of a vagabond type of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny that you bring that up because you said something about the the big waves in Portugal and all that. Uh, you, you, when you say surf, you, you think of Hawaii and California. I mean, that's or Australia and, and South Africa too. I guess those are like the big, the big ones that mm-hmm. pop into the the average Joe's uh, perception of where where is surf. But uh, you know, these guys, the, there's big surf along the coast of Europe, and even I think up in Ireland and places. There's some massive waves that I'm going there this October to Ireland to go surf. So are you really? Yeah, yeah. Well. One other thing, too, is that a lot of people always think that you need to have a coastline. There are places out in the middle of the ocean where there's giant waves that are formed, too, right? Right. We have one right off the coast here. You know, it's called Cortez Banks. It's a it's a upwell of, of, a, of a shallow reef in the mm-hmm. middle of the ocean. And um, during the winter, it gets giant swells that break, in, you know, 50, 60, 70-foot waves will be breaking out there. Well... 
that's a hundred miles out. Yeah, and the men in gr- gray suits. <laughs> yeah, the men in gray suits are uh, very prevalent out there. <laughs> if you get funny. my drift, <laughs> great white sharks. Yeah, no kidding. Huh? Um, well, now you mentioned something about the kids being sponsored and all that. Uh, Body Glove has sponsored a lot of people, I think, probably over the years in the in in all the water industries, right? Yeah, we've we've had uh, probably the. Anywhere from Jerry Lopez was part of our crew in the early 70s to mm-hmm. Kelly Slater when he first started his pro career. And and uh, you name it, we they probably wore our wetsuits or spo- we were sponsoring them for wetsuits. Uh, because back then in the 80s and 90s, there weren't a lot of companies that had both apparel and wetsuits. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'd always go with uh, some guys went with Quicksilver as an apparel sponsor or and then come to Body Glove for their wetsuits. But mm-hmm. now every brand out there uh, has both, you know, it's basically you, you hire a guy head to toe. Yeah. And then they're and then they're sponsored by Red Bull anyway. And, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> those guys got money to burn. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, but um, that's the thing. Uh, and now uh, with these new wave pools coming up, the surf culture is is heading from California is heading east. What's a wave pool? Don't know. What they have knows. a Kelly Slater developed a. Actually, the first wave pool was in Tempe, Arizona, back in the '60s, mm-hmm. where it was just a big pool, and they it was like a big, it was like a big toilet. And yeah. Flush it, and it'd make a big wave and a big swell, and you mm-hmm. can ride this wave. Now they've now they've made it so so uh, scientifically designed it that. Um, Kelly Slater developed a wave in in uh, Lamore, California, by Fresno mm-hmm. uh, at an old wave uh, at a wa- uh, old wakeboard park, mm-hmm. and uh, they're having the first in two weeks. Yeah, two weeks is the first uh, ASP event or uh, the WCT event, World World um, uh, Championship Tour, mm-hmm. um, at at a. At a wave pool. At an artificial... Artificial wave. wave. Perfect wave. And wow. now Every there's, time, right? There's a new one in Waco, Texas that's developed, and uh, we got involved as Body Glove. We got involved with a company called American Wave Machines out of Solana Beach, and um, uh, I helped find them. I, a friend of mine came to me one day and says, oh, I, his brother-in-law is looking for, to do a wave pool in Peru at a water park. Wow. So I introduced them to the, these guys, and... Mm-hmm. They built a wave pool for him down down in Peru. It was uh, pretty pretty cool. Wow! And uh, so it's heading east from here, so more of the inland people can can start surfing. Wow. Well, you know, it's funny because it, it really has been a east coast west coast or a coastal sport for everybody. Yeah. Uh, wow. Maybe people in Kansas will be. Well, you know, it's, it's, at some yeah, point. well, nowadays it's you, you got the the water ski industry back in the nineties, eighties, mm-hmm. and nineties, and then it turned into the wakeboard industry, and now uh, now the big thing behind for lakes and things like that is the uh, surfing behind the boat. Oh yeah, uh, you know, wake surf, yeah. and um, they've special developed boards for wake surfing and things like. So they have they have a whole tour a professional tour for that nowadays just like they did with the wakeboards and mm-hmm. to, you know the water ski tour well ha- has things. body glove uh, done anything in those other industries like wakeboarding oh, stuff yeah, we'd, or oh yeah we've sponsored we actually we have the the best two wakeboarders in the world riding body glove right now oh, all the time. so we do pfds which is the per- personal flotation devices mm-hmm. the vest we do wetsuits for those guys, specialized, you know, mm-hmm. wetsuits, and mainly it's a PFD business mm-hmm. for because people don't go on the the lakes during the winter very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mass mass majority of people Most don't go. Most people don't. Yeah, you know, they don't want to go in forty degree water. <laughs> <laughs> if there is any water, yeah. like where I'm from, there's there's just like two or three feet of ice, ice, <laughs> <laughs> which that's a whole other thing because people do that uh, yeah. uh, windsurfing. <clears throat> Excuse me, not windsurfing, but uh, Kite, kite skiing, whatever the hell. It kite is. boarding, kite boarding. <clears throat> but oh yeah, the, it, it just it, it blows my mind when when I think of uh, what probably was the main uh, fun sport in in the ocean, which was either boogie boarding, surfing, or just swimming, if you will. To now, uh, th- th- there's 
dozens and dozens and dozens of, of full-blown industries dedicated to their own niche uh, different type of sport from like the wakeboarding yeah. and all oh, that Oh, definitely. Stuff. And, uh, you know, a few years ago. Kite. Kiteboarding came in a few yeah. years ago after the windsurfing craze. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and then um, Laird Hamilton, who you can always blame Laird for this, but um, <laughs> he brought, he kind of developed the first paddleboard. And um, uh, I saw a picture of him riding a, they used to do it in Hawaii. It came from Hawaii, mm-hmm. basically, the paddle boarding. It was never called paddle boarding. They didn't really have a name for it. The Hawaiians used to paddle a big wood plank yep. with a paddle uh, across the bay or whatever, like a canoe, mm-hmm. a single man canoe. And, um, but Laird kind of developed these big long boards to he could surf and paddle, stand up, never have to lay down. And I saw a picture of him one day, and I, God, I want to try that. And I knew I had a, I have a big twelve foot tandem board mm-hmm. in my garage. I've had since the early eighties, and um, uh, so I went down. <laughs> Got a to my paddle. <laughs> I went down to my dad's boat in King Harbor and and took one of his uh, kayak paddles. He had <laughs> kayaks on top, and I cut one of the the blades off the other side. And I'm a, I play ice hockey, so I know how to tape up a stick on yeah, the yeah. on the handle. I created this big knob and I took my my tandem board out and I started stand up paddling Mm -hmm. and and then uh, the people were like amazed because I was like what's that guy doing yeah I was like the first guy ever doing it around here and um, uh, you know even the harbor patrol wouldn't let me do it in the harbor they didn't know what to call it (laughs) (laughs) that's gotta be illegal (laughs) yeah you gotta be illegal or something (laughs) Thus, then the the industry just boomed, took off, and um, I think know. we have five or six stand up paddle boards now, yeah. <laughs> actually. And uh, but it, you know the paddle boarding paddle board industry just kind of took the turn of just like the snowboard industry. It was a race to the bottom, see who can build the cheapest board and get it out there. And yeah, you know. Well, now uh, they have the inflatable ones too, right? The inflatable ones, when you, if you're a boat owner, they're the best. Yeah, we've got, that's the kind we've got. They don't ding your boat up too bad. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, the whole, I blame the whole industry on Laird. <laughs> Laird. Yeah. Well, he's responsible for a lot of stuff, I think, too, uh, actually. Yeah, uh, he, he was, he's pioneered the toe-in surfing. He yeah. pioneered, you know, basically the uh, rescue efforts for, you know, big wave, big wave surfing and yeah. things, using yeah. uh, uh, jet skis and mm-hmm. PWCs. And, uh, you know, he's done a lot for the industry. He's a good yeah. guy too. I always I'm, yeah. I'm friends with him, and I yeah. like him. And well, he's he's another one of those guys uh, that is one of those exceptional human beings. Let's just say that he's a true waterman. Yeah, That's, oh, there's no time. doubt. When yeah. you talk waterman, that the guy that whose his, name is the top of the list, his kind of, picture comes up yeah. when, when you look in the dictionary. You yeah. know those stand up pedal boards. You, you bring that up. That's a very cool thing because you know most people you think about. Uh, well, they're just kind of moseying along, and they're you know they're just a, a leisurely type thing going around on on calm water and all that. But you can actually surf those on pretty decent waves. Right? Oh yeah, we we sponsor a kid called his name is Mo Fridas from Hawaii, and mm-hmm. he actually last year was world champion. Um, oh, I've met him. He, he came over. Oh yeah, yeah. he I, yeah. I brought him over here. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, you gave some tea. He still rocks the uh, Emerson logo on his boards. <laughs> That's outstanding. Yeah. So, uh, um, but he surfs them, right? He surfs and he he does long distance paddling, mm-hmm. and um, so there's all kinds of different um, uh, um, criteria in in mm-hmm. the in the in the paddleboard industry. You have the surfing part where there's waves. You have uh, the the sprints. For uh, that go around, go out through the surf and back in, and and then you have river river races where it's kind of like kayaking, where you got to go through the you know these different down the yeah. course and you know things like that. And uh, he was world champion last year, and Love he's that. he does really well. And uh, uh, every board is different for mm-hmm. each one of those. So, uh, but nowadays they have the big thing is. Um, uh, well, back in the '80s, a guy named Mike Murphy invented a thing called the air chair for behind a boat. It was like a hmm. hydrofoil. You sat on a board and, and had a little seat, and you're strapped into it, and um, it would come up out of the water on a, a foil. Mm-hmm. Now they're using the foil. Uh, actually, Laird again 
was the first I guy to, to get yeah. an air chair and stand on it, take the seat off of it, and put <laughs> put ski boots. That doesn't surprise me at put all. Put ski boots on it, and that's how yeah. they started. Now they do it with just straps. Some of the, some of the foil boards now, they, they um, uh, don't even use straps. Well, you know? d- just so people understand... We're talking about a surfboard that rides above the water. Yeah. Then, correct? Yes. It's, it foils you up about two feet out of the water, and it's just you're just It's gliding. crazy to see. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and now they have it on paddle boards, too. They have them on long oh, really? on paddle boards. So when they do a, a, they're not allowed in any types of races yet, mm-hmm. but um, in Hawaii, they do these paddleboard races, these eight-mile paddleboard races. They'll be down, called downwinder, downwinders, mm-hmm. and you're riding the swells of, from the from the heavy winds, yep. and you get you're you're, oh. you, you're hauling ass. No kidding. Yeah. And um, you were talking about paddleboarding down in Hawaii uh, just this weekend. That wasn't there a paddleboard event you guys were kind of involved in in some way, uh, or you were helping with it, or something from? Uh, not this weekend. Um, no, oh, what was oh, it? Just oh, this last weekend was yes, the yes. this last weekend was the Catalina Classic paddleboard okay. race. It's a thirty-two mile paddleboard race, but it's not for stand-up paddling. Mm-hmm. It's only for prone paddling. So, so you're you laying your, down. You're laying down, or you're on your knees, and you're using your hands. No, we're talking miles. across open ocean out there. <laughs> oh yeah, thirty-two miles across the Catalina Channel to Manhattan Beach Pier from two harbors in Catalina to the Manhattan Beach Pier. And how long does something like that take? Well, the guy did it. Uh, the guy that won did it in, I think, five twenty-nine, five hours twenty-nine minutes. Are you kidding me? That's not the record. The record, yeah. I think, is five and seven, five hours seven minutes. Wow. So, and that's you know, there's sharks out there. There's giant. I mean, if you've never been near one, the giant cargo vessels they're they're gargantuan. They're like something out of a science fiction movie, and. Uh, You've got to negotiate through all. Yeah, you never try to outrun stuff. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't oh they, yeah, don't they have humpback whales and blue whales, right? Yeah, we get we, we get we get a lot of whales and and uh, all kinds of things, sharks, and you don't see very much. I mean, it, it, the sh- it's a hit, big ocean. Getting hit by a shark out here is like getting hit by lightning, you know. Yeah. And uh, but you know, there's all kinds of different things you see. Each paddler has an escort boat too, okay. so they have a boat right next to them. They can't get on the boat for any reason, or yeah. they disqualified. You know, there's all kinds of rules and mm-hmm. regulations and stuff. So, and our our boat, our boat, the disappearance, the bug body glove mm-hmm. boat, uh, it, 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 they've been the lead boat for the race for the last 35 years. I'll be darned. So, now, are those mainly local people that compete in that? They event? come, from, they come from, from all over. There was guys from Hawaii. There was guys from Santa Cruz, from San Diego, mm-hmm. up and down the coast. You know, a couple guys from Florida came out to do it because this is one of the most prestigious paddleboard events. Uh, really? Yeah. Just like the, it's, you have the Molokai from Molokai to Oahu, mm-hmm. which is 32 miles too. Yeah. And that's across, that's even probably a little bit harder than this, but this is the oldest paddleboard event I'll be done. ever. I'll tell you what, uh, you know, you think about a, a marathon, and it's a 26 or 27 mile run, whatever, uh, and it kind of it, it follows a path through through cities or up and down hills and all that. And it's believe me, it's a it's a ballsy thing. Don't I'm not putting it down or anything. But I'll tell you what, when you are at basically water level, all you see is the swells you can't see the land uh you can't see the destination you you know if i'm standing up uh on on a hill i can see catalina island and uh but i'll tell you what when you go down to water level it's just water there's no and and, you know swells can be two three four five feet high uh that's that's quite a soul-searching endeavor it must be a (laughs) yeah it's a it's a it's a fun it's a fun day on the water, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> until you're done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've I did it. I've I've um, I've done a lot of paddleboarding, prone paddleboarding. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the early '90s, some friends of mine and myself, we developed a, a organization called the Southern California Paddleboard Association, mm-hmm. and we did it 
to uh, basically go on trips and get away from, you know, it's like going on a surf trip. Yeah. Yeah. In fa- instead, we'd go on a paddle trip and we'd paddle a body of water. And the first first trip we did was we drove up to San Francisco and we jumped in the water at Fort Point and paddled underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, wow. shook hands, and we started paddling to to Berkeley. With, we didn't have permits. We couldn't. You're not supposed to do that. You know, we were <laughs> kind of like the base jumpers. Eh? We were dodging freighters and all kinds of big ships and ferries and stuff. We went. To, we got to Alcatraz Island. We went up on the rock and climbed up and jumped off. We played that we were escaping from Alcatraz. You know, but we got to Berkeley and we spent the night and got up the next morning and we drove up to Lake Tahoe mm-hmm. to a friend's house up there. And the following morning, we drove around to Emerald Bay in uh, Lake Tahoe, jumped mm-hmm. in the water, and paddled to the Incline Village, twenty-six miles, Dang. with no support. Oh, well, actually, we had a we had a jet ski. Oh, we had okay. one guy on a jet ski. Yeah, but you carry your own water, you carry mm-hmm. your own, uh, uh, you know, power bars. I don't even know what we ate yeah. back then. I think we had <laughs> granola, pro- probably granola bar. Yeah, well, I don't even think I ate that. I think we ate <laughs> Lay's potato chips, yeah, on really. or something. <laughs> <laughs> Doritos. Yeah, they always do in a pinch. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that started our our um, crossing different bodies of water, and mm-hmm. some of the guys did. Uh, the English Channel. They did the Irish Sea from Ireland to Scotland. We oh, did. Wow. We did. Uh, uh, we did Loch Ness. The le- wow. Le- yeah, that's like twenty <laughs> miles long, or twenty-two miles long. Oh, so, you did the long way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a trip. You didn't yeah. see Nessie out no, there. No, well, we had little. Everybody had a little Nessie <laughs> taped to their board. It's pretty funny. Maybe that's but, uh, a good thing you didn't see it. <laughs> you know, some of the guys went flew to Spain and they they went from. Um, uh, Gibraltar to um, Tangier, yeah, and got arrested by the the <laughs> government over there for a little while. <laughs> then Bud made it back. But it was fun. It, it's a, more of a boondoggle to go mm-hmm. get away and do something for one day fun, yeah. and then. But well, you, you know, turn what? a trip like that into a seven or ten day trip. So it's, yeah. Well, what's cool is again, it's that sense of adventure doing something that. Most people never get a chance to do or, or will never do or have never been done before. Uh, that's that's that, that lifestyle, man. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's but, funny because the Body Glove brand is a lifestyle. Well, I've always the, identified. I think it's the most ultimate yeah. lifestyle brand ever, for especially around water. I mean, mm-hmm. you, have, you have different brands like Nike that are more sports-oriented yeah, yeah. and um, uh, Adidas, uh, those, but... For the the water type of if, – if you're into this type of um, paddleboarding or surfing or diving or whatever you're into in the water, boating even, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's, it's probably the ultimate lifestyle brand. Uh, boating. Since we have a sailboat and you guys have a number of boats actually uh, down there at the, in the harbor and everything, uh, you were – one time you were telling me that you were actually – bringing sailboats back from Europe, right? Well, back in uh, late 70s, I, I, moved up, I moved back from Catalina Island, uh, living there after I graduated from high school and working at the store. And my dad had a friend of his that, that had a big sailboat and sold it to a Turkish guy. And mm-hmm. his, he took it down the coast. And I wasn't on the first leg. He, he asked me to go on the heavy leg, which was from uh, Florida to Spain. Crossing mm-hmm. the English, uh, crossing the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So I said, "Sure, why not?" I'm and 21 big, and I'm dumb. Yeah, <laughs> I really? can do it. <laughs> how big was that boat? 49 foot. Yeah. So I get to get to Florida and and um, meet the guy, other people that are going. There's six of us on the boat, and there's one gal, the gal that's a cook on the boat, and she she's a German lady, German gal, mm-hmm. and um, she had crossed the channel four times. Mm-hmm. Got hit by freighters three times. Oh no way! After finding this out, we f- <laughs> we, yeah. we let her go. <laughs> no no bad juju on this yeah, boat. No kidding. <laughs> you know, it's funny people don't people don't realize something. You look at the ocean and it's wide open. It's not like the freeway. You still can run into stuff out there. You know, it's funny. I, I was just telling this story uh, over the weekend in Catalina. 
I never saw crossing the channel, uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. I have never seen, I never saw a freighter during the day. But we used to dodge 10 or 12 at night. Oh, really? Them because you can, you can see their lights. Yeah. Tell, they'll tell which way they're going and you can mm-hmm. maneuver and where you are yeah in maneuver relation. your boat away from it but it was it was pretty hairball uh, I was 18 I, it took me 18 days 6 hours and 22 minutes that's my I still have that number in my mm-hmm. head from when I got on the boat and we shoved off to landing in in uh, the Azor Islands mm-hmm. and um, this was in 1979 and uh, until I got on land, and then it was another ten days from Azores to Portubana, Spain. Really? Yeah. Now, didn't you guys run into some oh, a, yeah. a big storm or oh, something? We ran into all kinds of storms. Yeah, and uh, so. I remember you telling me, of course, when you're on a sailboat at night, uh, and, and probably not a bad idea even during, <laughs> during the day when you're out on the on the real ocean, uh, is you're tethered, right? Yeah, we would always, especially during the night. Uh, you'd be tethered in and you always have a guy that's John watch with you and one night we were sailing up the actually we were sailing up the Straits of Gibraltar and there was huge swells coming out of the Mediterranean Mm -hmm. and um, the guy tacked into a wave and we submarined the boat and I got knocked overboard but I was tethered to the to the halyard and and uh the guys got me up. And I said, "I'm not going back up there." <laughs> well, you would have I'm been staying in the cockpit, <laughs> and you would have been a goner for sure. Oh yeah, there yeah. Was no way that could they have found me. It was the middle of the night. I had foul weather gear on, heavy boot, you know, f- yeah. f- foul weather gear boots. I probably just would have sunk right down. But Davy Jones locker. Yeah, man. you know, it's uh, the risk you take when you want to go <laughs> yeah. go do something. <laughs> so you mentioned the Mediterranean. Is there is there any surfing? In the Mediterranean? Yeah, is there it? is. They're surfing in, in Italy and in, down in um, uh, uh, off of Sicily. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some, you know, they get you get the the winds coming out of North Africa mm-hmm. off, off the continent. They call the Mistral winds, mm-hmm. and uh, so they'll blow off of the off the uh, out of the North Africa, and then um, make swells coming into France and into Spain. I surfed actually um, San Tropez one time on a long board. On a, oh, no way. Uh, on a, uh, the only board I could find was a uh, an old windsurfer, and uh, <laughs> so I went down on the beach and there was like four foot waves. And I grabbed this board, mm-hmm. and the guy goes, "You want the sail?" And he's trying to talk to me in, in French, and I go, "No, no, I just want the board to paddle." Yeah, yeah. So I paddled out, and as I'm surfing, there's all these naked women popping up over these waves. I've kept falling <laughs> off, but... <laughs> a little distracted. Yeah, a little distracted. <laughs> but it all was, those Frenchies. Yeah. I got to say I surfed Saint-Tropez once. Oh, man, that's yeah, crazy. So. Well, you know, the thing about Body Glove, and again, it, it might be true for some of the other brands, too, but uh, both you and your brother uh, were both water waterman people if you will your dad his brother so this brand was born out of an intimate knowledge of what works and what doesn't and you know that that i think probably is a a large aspect of why it's been so successful is because you know you guys actually did you know as opposed to a lot of companies that are out there now and i'm not specifically talking about uh uh, the surf industry, but a lot of companies are are the products are designed and or formed or thought up by people that have no real connection to no that's true yeah know, no, to, we, to what their product is for. I have two brothers and I have a cousin that's it's a good a good what we're all good watermen mm-hmm. uh, my two older brothers are now more, mainly golfers, but mm-hmm. you know they don't get in the water as much as I do and uh, but you know, we were all kind of back in the day. We would think of things. You know, how can we make this better? Mm-hmm. You know, and we came up with a lot of different things. My dad and my uncle started basically. They were part of the first culture of the surf industry that sprang this, you know, multi-billion-dollar industry. Yeah. You know, and um, uh, uh, they were the pioneers. They were the, you know, the. 10 or 20 guys that they were breaking the ground breaking the ground yeah just like i mean i you can probably say the same thing about the knife industry you know there are a lot of mm-hmm. you know i don't know 
I can't think of an old, I, the only old knife, <laughs> buck. That I, a buck knife, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they were the guys that, that kind of made the whole yeah. knife industry. You might, Pretty much, yeah. At, at retail, yeah. you know. Because um, I remember we used to carry buck knives at, at our store. Oh, yeah. You know. And, uh, I carried a buck knife for many, many years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's neat to see. You know, I, I, I don't really think you're ever going to get an industry like this industry or the surf industry or ever coming back because it's, they're so, we're kind of, we're drying up a lot of mm-hmm. these things. And most of the, most of the industries are going more high tech. You know, it's like, it's the Google guy or the, yeah. you know, the guy that's making the next, you know, app for your phone, you know, yeah. that's where the industry's uh, going. But, you know, there are small little industries that are popping up here and there though. So, you know, well, you're still out in search of those industries, right? I mean, yeah, I, isn't that kind of what you're? I, I kind of um, a few years back, I got I got diagnosed with leukemia, so I kind of left the company mm-hmm. after working there. I ran the licensing department for uh, uh, about 19 years for mm-hmm. for uh, for Body Glove, and then when I got diagnosed with leukemia, a very rare form of it, I kind of told my brothers, I'm going to take some time off and get well, and and. One year turned into two, two turned into four, and, you know, I'm kind of liking it, you know, being <laughs> off all the time. But I got bored and, and started consulting for some a paddleboard company. They made me a partner in it and mm-hmm. uh, consulted for some other people. I did a little you, consulting for you in the knife industry. That's a backstory too. I mean, yeah. And, uh, you uh, came on board with us for, for quite a while. Yeah, about almost, six, six months Yeah, or so. and yeah. Uh, put us in touch with some ideas that uh, – we just weren't thinking out of the box, and uh, you helped us kind of get our foot in the door for some from some major things. Uh, uh, you were instrumental in uh, our association with uh, Kershaw, and that worked out yeah really well for us. So you know, it, it, again, you know, you're still out there doing all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to stay busy as yeah. much as I can. I still want to surf as much as I can. It, that's kind of my passion, really. It's always been my passion, but, you know, I'm trying to get in the water every day. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, now we've we've kind of gone uh, past my surfing days, so to speak, but we do have that sailboat. And uh, I'll tell you what, when, when we were mulling over whether we should get one or not, and, uh, you know, we... We've got a cabin up in the mountains, too, that we, we go up to uh, as often as we can. And I remember you sitting in uh, the office with my wife and I, and you said, Ernie, if you get that sailboat, you, you won't be going up to the mountains anymore. <laughs> You'll be out on the water in it. And i got to tell you, uh, that's become pretty true. Uh, we don't get out there as much as we want because I'm sitting here almost every day going, damn, I wish I could get off early so I could get on, get out on that sailboat. But there's something about that, man. I, I don't know what it is. Again, uh, when that wind, when you shut the, the motor off and the wind catches those sails and off you go and it's silent except for the, the, the water line against the boat, uh, I, I just... It, it, that's it's a, a stoke it's a of total, its own. total different feeling. Yeah, you know, if people haven't been ever on a on the ocean or in a boat, and I mean, most people have been on boats on lakes and things like that, mm-hmm. but it's it's a little different being in the ocean. And, you know, I'll I'll take my little <coughs> fishing boat sometimes and go out ten or fifteen miles by myself, mm-hmm. shut the engine off, and just jump in the water in you know two thousand oh, two thousand feet of water, and I'll just lay in, <laughs> lay on my back and and, and think, you know. And, uh, Not me, man. I don't, I don't worry about I don't worry about sharks or anything. I don't, hey, if I'm I always eaten, worried about sharks. If I get eaten, that's probably the you probably the out. way I'm going to go. Yeah, you there know. you go. But, um, Have you seen a shark since you're in the water all the time? I'm sure you've yeah, seen we, it a couple I, times, right? I've been, you know, around here it's hard to see sharks anymore because they they're so um, uh, they've been fished out over the years. Um, we have a few great white baby great whites that are that live down in the North Manhattan area, and mm-hmm. I was out on the boat. I was cruising right along the beach, probably a two hundred yards off the shore, and there's probably a hundred hundred junior lifeguards swimming around the buoy, and they swim out a hundred yards. So I'm probably a hundred yards out from them, and a little baby great white, it's like six feet long, is swimming right by. God, you know, that's taller than me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. They, they eat small fish, but. 
Yeah, they won't attack a... <laughs> or bits and parts of human yeah. beings. Right? <laughs> like, Hopefully. Like a leg or an arm. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> but, uh, you, know, yeah, you, don't see, you don't see them as, as much as you used to see them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I've been chased out of the water in Hawaii by tigers, tigers. And, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Where you see a big fin, you go, whoop, time to get out of the water. You know, it's weird. Paddle in. Uh, my, my wife and I were down there. This was a few years ago now. And uh, we were on Maui. And we were driving along. And, you know, you can just pull off the side of the road, I mean, and, and go in the water. And uh, so we did. And actually, I think we stopped because there were some people that were stuck in the sand on the side of the road. And so we stopped to help, you know, push their uh, their their car out of the sand and get it back on the, on the road. And while we were standing there, we said, wow, this looks like a pretty good place to, to snorkel. And uh, so we said, well, we're here. Let's, we got our stuff with us. Let's hop in the water. So nobody's there just me and my wife and we go out and we're kind of cruising along we're probably 50 60 70 feet offshore more or less it's kind of murky water and it was one of those weird weird feelings randy i don't know what it is that there's something just beyond that haze that's watching you or whatever right and i was feeling it and then my wife she kind of turned around and said and, and she shook her head and she pointed towards shore and I said, okay, let's, she wants to just go in. So we went in and I said, what's, what's going on? She goes, man, I just had a, I had a weird vibe that there was something in the water watching us. And we were like, oh, okay, you know, maybe, maybe not. And lo and behold, two days later uh, at that same exact beach, because we were there for about two weeks, uh, a, a guy got attacked by a tiger shark and uh, he wasn't killed or anything, but it, it nailed him on the leg and, and we... It was on the news and everything, and it was that exact same spot. I know exactly where you're talking. About. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, who knows? Maybe, it, maybe our time didn't. We, <laughs> maybe he just I mean, ate. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> they'll, I'm not they'll, hungry. <laughs> they'll, they'll, chase, they'll chase the turtles and eat them before they'll eat you. Yeah, so. yeah. Normal. Well, I've seen some of the turtles down there when you're in the water, and they'll be, you know, what happened to his fin? It's gone, you know. Yeah, yeah. They get. They get bit by sharks all the time. Yeah. We get a few green turtles out here. Mm-hmm. You know. I've never seen one here yeah. recently. Uh, I've, I've, there's one in Cherry Cove in Catalina that lives there. Now. Oh, really? Yeah, he just kind of li- lingers in the whole cove and well, stuff. I'll be done. So it's huh. pretty cool. Well, Randy, this is excellent, and uh, I'm just I'm really excited. I've, I've been really uh, I've been excited to to know you over the years and all that too. Because again. I was so, in, and I still am so enamored with all the things that have to do with the ocean. And again, coming from where I was, where, you know, and, and I got to tell you, honestly, uh, Minnesota says that they're the land of 10,000 lakes, and they, and they kind of na- nailed that on their, uh, uh, for their state slogan, so to speak. But Wisconsin's got 13,000 lakes, so we're, we're up by over 3,000 over Minnesota. And, uh, but they're lakes, and there's a big, big difference between a lake and an ocean. And I'll tell you, the the first time that I came to California, uh, I'm used to a little, maybe a little sand, uh, you know, 20 by 30 foot piece of sand on a lakeshore that somebody's kind of cleared and, and you can, you have to have a sand beach. And I, I pulled down into Redondo Beach and I looked out over the strand towards the ocean and there's, it's like 150 yards of unbelievable sand all the way out to the ocean it 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 blew my mind and from that we went it was me and some buddies we went out and we we the first time i've ever been knocked on my ass by a wave uh small you know probably two or three footers shore break uh i understood the power of that ocean was powers of magnitude beyond anything i'd ever experienced in a in a freshwater lake but it it hooked me, and you know from that point forward, I've I've loved the ocean. Uh, you know, you talk about the the business environment here in California. God damn it! It's if it wasn't for that ocean, we would have been gone a long time ago. But That's there's true. something about that <clears throat> that blue water out there that we we just can't leave the coast. Uh, and plus, we kind of live in a bubble here. Yeah. yeah. You're you're, you're close to 20 million people, but you're so far away from them too. Sometimes, yeah. All you, know? you got to do is look west, yeah. and it's wide open territory. Yeah. So, yeah. and uh, you know, Body Glove is one of those 
names. Again, I'm telling you, I saw that. I was like, what the hell is that? And it was that weird, uh, you guys, oh, I just wanted to, I think you were one of, and again, I'm, this is just me observing, but the body glove stickers, it was. Uh, it seems to me that Body Glove was one of the first companies that ever had stickers. That's, that's a funny story because uh, and they were everywhere. We did a we did a surf contest in Malibu, and this was yeah. We were we 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 got so into so many different things besides just the wetsuit business and the licensing business. We we my brothers uh, and and all of us did we developed the first pro surfing circuit. In really? California, for sur- for surfers going into the the upper echelon of competing, mm-hmm. um, uh, it was called the Bud Surf Tour. We had Budweiser as a sponsor and things like that. So that helped a lot of the the up and coming surfers develop their talent to go to the back then it was the ASP mm-hmm. uh, Association of Surfing Professionals, and um, um, uh, but we we developed all that and um um to really help the the industry we Mm -hmm. we lost a lot of money at it but we we did a lot of things that helped the industry and that was a a lot of things that we did uh as a family Mm -hmm. and as a family as a family company you know not everything makes you makes you makes you money so but um um stickers the stickers oh now you got. Now I remember what I was <laughs> You're looking to. nostalgic there for a moment. I know. I, I, I drew up. Brain, <laughs> my brain went one way. Uh, I we started putting stickers on stop signs, <laughs> and we'd get these young surfers, and they we'd hand them a hundred stickers, <laughs> and they'd plaster them everywhere. everywhere. And you know they're on every stop sign, every U-turn sign, every <laughs> every sign around town from from Santa Cruz to San Diego. Yeah, and. Um, uh, uh, I bought, I think, a hundred thousand stickers. I spent like six grand on stickers. Oh my stickers. gosh! Yeah, and I almost. What my, are you doing? And my uncle almost <laughs> fired me because of it. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, you crazy? And I go. Yeah. It's putting our brand out there. It's, it's guerrilla marketing. It's, yeah, yeah. You know. And now, yeah, you know, we were the big sticker. Everybody had that black and yellow sticker. Oh yeah, you could yep. see it from a mile. You, you could. You it's know. uh, it's an iconic figure. You, it's you know, that what's, glove. What's funny is glove. What's funny is over the years, my brothers, like, yeah, we got to have black and yellow. We got to have the, the the sticker can't change. And this, we're not changing our logo. Then we brought as we started building our business in the late eighty or late nineties and stuff. People were saying, oh, you're, you know, it's too old of look. You know, it's Got to jazz it. Got to jazz it up a little bit, and so they changed it. They did this and they did that. We still had the round sticker. Mm-hmm. We still had it, but we were marketing a, the hand in a different way at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, now it's we're back to the original sticker. <laughs> That's all we use. It's everywhere now. You nailed and, it from the get. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my brother was my oldest brother was right. He goes, "Never change your, yeah. never change your logo." Yeah. Coca-Cola never changed their logo. No. no, Nike never changed their logo. You know, that's right. It, it's that iconic hand with a circle around it. Yeah, and um, uh, you know, it's it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, honest, everywhere. And uh, well, I've seen those dive and surf uh, stickers out there. Yeah, we too. They're we pretty do, cool. We do pretty good. Yeah, with that too. So. But uh, yeah, Randy, I was just going to say uh, you're. You're out there. Um, like I said, you look great. I mean, honest. Uh, you know, I, I go back to my class reunion from time to time, and, and I look at people that are, are my age, our age, and I go, wow, what happened to you and all that. And, uh, you know, the fact that you're out there still paddling away <laughs> and surfing and sailing and motorboating and everything else, uh, uh, you wear it really well. And well, I, thank and you. I, I also think that uh, there's an attitude that uh, you can talk to people and they seem old. Then you talk to people and it's like, dude, you're 18, I'm 18. We're sitting in a bar somewhere drinking a beer. That's that's the feeling that I get uh, every time that I'm, uh, you know, hanging out with you and all that. And that's, I think that's a huge 
part of staying young. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah the lifestyle is a, is a yeah. big part. We live in a great area, and yeah, I always said the salt water and the sunshine is always good for you. So hell yes. Yeah. Well, Randy, on that note, uh, this has been a a fun fun uh, podcast, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for inviting me over. Oh, for God's sakes, it's a it's it's so cool to to know and learn some of those backstories about. Uh, you know the things that I admire and the things I, that I've used. I forgot the. Br- I have it in my car. Mm-hmm. I have a book for you, the Body Glove story. We 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 finished mm-hmm. the book right right after uh, right after my dad passed away five mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, we well, have. A, I have a book for you. I'll okay. give it to you before I leave. So. Well, okay, then let's let's talk about it just for a second. Uh, the 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 Body Glove. What's the what's the state of Body Glove today? Uh, I mean. It's kind of where can you get body glove? I mean, all you have to do is type the name in, right? Yeah. yeah. But if you're ever in uh, Southern California, you got to go to the dive and surf. There, there's some memorabilia in that. In yeah, there too, right? Since the two founders are are past, um, we've developed the store to be more. It's a great retail store. It's beautiful. It's mm-hmm. one of the best surf shops I've ever been in. And but it's not only a surf shop. It's a it's a museum of mm-hmm. of relics and different things that my dad and my uncle collected and even things that I collected, my brothers collected, my cousins collected. Um, we, we try to keep the heritage and the, the, uh, uh, going, you know, as much mm-hmm. as we can. Uh, two years ago, we took on a, uh, equity partner in the body glove brand side mm-hmm. of things. So we're, uh, we're, we still have a stake in the brand, but we are now, uh, it's being run by a, a, a new company. Mm-hmm. And actually, the good thing is my son, my middle son, Nick, he's the uh, marketing director for Body Glove Worldwide. So he's still – Oh, wow. Uh, uh, it, there's, there's still a family aspect to the brand. Mm-hmm. You know, It's got the third generation. And my cousin's daughter, Jenna, is still working there too. So, um, But it's with a big company, and sometimes to get to that next level, you need that, that – Yeah. That – influx of uh money to mm-hmm. to get it there yeah. and uh this company was a great company to partner with and and uh but we all still own a piece of the action mm-hmm. too so we're not we're not totally out yet yeah. so well they seem to be shepherding it quite well because it's still out there you guys are always coming up with new products uh i mean who knows what's going to be in five or ten years i mean yeah for i'm hoping it's going to be a billion dollar company back by, wow by the that's excellent. By, the, by ten years, <laughs> so uh, well, I hope you're right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's funny too when you mention the uh, the surf industry and all that. I mean, honest, you can go to Colorado, you can go to uh, uh, Northern Canada, and guys are wearing surf hats and surf shirts and everything else. It, it, there's some just something about it. Uh, I guess when it's 35 below zero and it's winter, it makes you feel cool to have a. <laughs> A body glove T-shirt on with a picture of the sunset going down over a, over a lifeguard tower or something. Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so, well, Randy, again, thank you for coming by. I really appreciate it. Thank and, you, Randy. Uh, honest, uh, those of you out there, I, I I hit Randy all the time with technical questions and things and asking for advice uh, regarding our knife company and and my, my boat and and. Uh, what I should get to be out in the water. So again, you've been you've been a real <laughs> a real good resource for me for all kinds of stuff yeah. like that. So well, it's been fun. We've known each other for quite a few years, and yeah. and uh, we don't have as much fun off the time as we do <laughs> probably on the time. So much, but, <laughs> Seems that yeah. way. So, but anyway, thank you, Randy. And oh, just if someone wants to buy body glove stuff, uh, you can go to you can go to bodyglove.com. Yep, and uh, get it get it there and. Uh, they have a full selection of any kind of product you need. Okay, so. and, and are you sold like on Amazon and all that? Amazon, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, wetsuits. Every, I mean, what yeah. isn't sold on Amazon today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, folks, if you want to find out uh, about the uh, body glove products and all that, uh, of course, go to their website. And uh, but again, you'll you'll find them in stores and things all over the world. So. Uh, on that note, uh, again, once again, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. And Danny, thank you. 
Thanks, uh, Danny. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so there you have it, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. I wanted to thank our sponsors today, uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu-Jitsu South Bay. Uh, and uh, they're found at uh, Hoist Gracie South Bay, uh, Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu South Bay dot com. Yeah. And uh, also uh, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock, found at uh, Order of the Black Shamrock dot com. And uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can uh, find us on all the podcast apps, Twitters and Instagrams and Stitchers and all that good stuff. So we're we're out there. And uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, be sure that uh, we all take time to to thank all the people that make our wonderful lives possible. And uh, so I want to just say, hey, you know what? It's time to uh, think every once in a while uh, in your busy day. Uh, take the time to uh, to think about. And, and, and if you meet any of these people in person, to, to put your hand out and, and thank them and tell them how much you appreciate uh, what they're doing, and those people are the uh, the soldiers, uh, the sailors, the airmen, the marines, the coasties, uh, all of the people that uh, wear the uniform or the badge, uh, including all of our first responders. Uh, you know, those people are out there every day doing uh, the the dirty work that uh, keep us safe and putting their lives and, and their futures on the line, and uh, we owe them everything. Uh, you know, our ability to have uh, uh, the greatest nation that uh, has ever existed on this planet is a result of the efforts of those people, the, the sacrifices that they've made and are, and are still going to be making for us. And it's because of their efforts that uh, all of us can uh, sleep soundly uh, in our beds at night. And uh, we thank all of you and are eternally grateful for your service and uh, all the things that you do for us. And uh, on that note, Danny... I think it's time to say goodbye. Very good. Signing out. <laughs>